Hola, my name is Juan Araya. I'm a cybersecurity specialist, and today I'm going to talk about oceanography and malware from scratch. So a little bit about me. Um, as I said, my name is Juan Araya. I'm a cloud security architect. I have a bachelor's degree in computer science, in this case from the University of Costa Rica. I have a master in cybersecurity. Down there you can see, you can find my LinkedIn profile in case you want to add me as a contact, and I'll be more than glad to interact with each and every one of you. From the recent certification, these are some of my most recent certifications, especially the CompTIA Certified Advanced Security Practitioner. I'm now getting a specialized in cloud technology like AWS and Azure. So little by little, as you know, we are in an area where we cannot stop you know, studying. So we need to continue enhancing our knowledge. So that's why little by little, I'm trying to get as much certifications as possible and to continue studying because that's the way that's the only way to keep uh, our knowledge up to date. All right, so enough about me. So let's go straight to the point about this technology and malware from scratch. So this is agenda. So first I'm gonna talk about what is malware. Then we will know, we will, I'll share information about this technology, what it is. Uh, of course, the technology, don't get me wrong, this technology is not bad at all. You know, it has been used for legitimate purposes, for example, for copyright protection but also can be used to hide information, can be used to steal data, can be used to send payloads and many other stuff. So that's why after I share information about what is steganography, I'll talk about a stackware, where in a stackware, we're gonna use steganography techniques to, again, hide data, steal information, send payloads, and many other malicious uh, actions. And of course, at the end, I'm gonna talk about security measures, you know, some recommendations that will protect your company, will protect your data against attacks using Stackware. So let's talk, before I go to Stackware and, and Stackware, it is important to uh, clarify what is malware. So malware stands for malicious software. It is designed to steal data to affect the confidentiality of the data. In other words, to be able to access data that you're not authorized, to be able to damage, you know, tamper a database, to alter data. So that's, in other words, to affect the integ integrity of the information. And finally, to affect the availability of the service. For example, to send a lot of requests that will overwhelm a server or will cause a denial of service attack. So what, which are the most common type of malware that are down there at the jungle of the internet. So let's talk about one of the most the most simple, in this case would be a Trojan. A Trojan is a software that it looks like a legitimate software, looks like a legitimate application. application. For example, you download a, a, um, a version from Microsoft that you didn't pay, right? And uh, of course it will work, but you know that Microsoft products, in this case, Microsoft Office is not for free. So, People that wants to um, do illegal stuff like using, you know, a software without the proper license, sometimes they fall in this in this situation, and they start using an application that looks like legitimate. They start using um, a fake version of a or you know a tampered version of a Windows or a, even a free game. So they look legitimate, and these type of uh, Trojan applications not, are not only available for you know desktop computers or server computers. Of course, in in the Apple Store, in the Play Store, you know, in Android devices, there are many applications that looks legitimate but are not. So what what is what what could go wrong? So for example, when you open up one of these applications, and at the same time that you're able to use it, you know, as the way it is supposed to do. It will, it will especially easily, I'm sorry, it could easily start contacting, you know, the attacker. It could easily start trying to steal information. It could try to download a keylogger, you know, which is another type of malware that we're talking a few minutes. Or, uh, or why not, you know, maybe download a worm that will uh, try to distribute a ransomware. Okay. So the other type of malware that is very common nowadays would be a bot. So what is a bot? A bot will be a computer that has been infected or compromised. We normally call this type of computer that once it is when it has been compromised, we call it a zombie computer. Why? Because it will start receiving instructions remotely from the attacker. How is it going to start receiving the, those type of instructions? Normally, the attacker is going to configure something that is known as a command and control. So the command and control will start, you know, pinging and contacting the different compromised computers to verify if they're still compromised. And the attacker is going to send an instruction to the command and control, for example, try to connect to this specific website. 
So maybe the website is designed to manage, and I don't know, like as an, an example, like 1,000 requests per hour. And suddenly it received like 100 million of requests. So of course, the server is not ready to manage that type of workload and it will cause a denial of service. So that is one of the many use sets um, that you can implement using a bot. In this case, the, um, the group of bots is known as a botnet. So once you are able to control the botnet, you can use it for causing denial of service. You can use it to try over and over, maybe a, some credentials that has been sent that has been instilled previously. So you can try to perform an attack, account takeover attack and many others. The other type of malware that nowadays is very, very dangerous will be a worm. Why? Because a worm is designed to automatically copy itself once it detects that, that, that a specific vulnerability is present. For example, there's a missing patch on some servers, okay? So once it detects that there's a missing patch on those servers, it will try to copy it automatically. And once it copy automatically, it will infect that computer and it will download, for example, a ransomware. And that's the next one. So the, the ransomware will be a type of malware designed to encrypt the data and steal the data. And so the, the victim in, the, in this case is not going to be longer able to read, to have access to their information, their files. Many companies are not ready to, to detect and they are not ready to survive after a ransomware attack. They, are, they don't have like an incident management plan. They, they, they are, their backups are not performed properly. They don't test their backups and so on. So that's why attackers in that case, once they are able to encrypt the data, they send some ransom notes asking, okay, if you pay me this amount of money, then maybe I will return your files, you know, but there's no guarantee, you know, nobody's gonna guarantee that you're gonna receive the data without any, um, uh, with, without any uh, malware inside, you're, they don't guarantee that they already they didn't already copy that that information, right? And they already distributed um, on the deep web, you know, with other criminals. So my suggestion at this point is: remember, do not pay, do not pay whatever is asked on a ransomware attack. Okay, so get ready. Prepare your incident management plan, have a good backups and many other stuff that I'll share at the end of this, this presentation. But ransomware is a big thing. So an equal, an equal effect anybody at any moment. The other type of malware is known as adware. The adware is designed to earn money in an illegal way using a legal process. In other words, there are some companies that are willing to pay if you're able to you know, to obtain new users, new customers, you know, to access their website. So they have like a pay, pay per click, you know, program. So some attackers will, will infect computers and those computers will simulate those clicks and the attacker will earn money. The company will start paying, thinking that they are getting new and new customers, but at the end, they are not really new customers. They are simulated customers. The next one will be in this case, a spyware. The spyware will be a type of malware, as the way it says, that is designed to spy, to know whatever, to record whatever you uh, type. You know, in this case, all your keystrokes are going to be registered. The attacker could have access to your video camera. You know, so uh, that could affect you know privacy. That could affect, for example, with a keylogger, they will be able to obtain your username and password of your bank and then perform wire transfer and so on. There are other type of um, malware. In this case, these two are very similar, but this one is a very interesting one. So this is a virus, as you know, which is a malicious software that is designed to copy automatically. For example, once you infect a USB key and you connect the USB key to a computer, it will automatically, when the, using the auto run option, it will copy automatically to the target computer, right? And it will execute whatever it is, it is assigned to, you know, damage information, download more malware, whatever. Now, there's another type of virus, in this case, the Amor virus, that is, that is a polyformic uh, virus that also has encryption and obfuscation. So the idea is to make really hard or harder, you know, the process of reverse engineering. So that way, for the people that are there to protect, it will be a, a lot harder to understand what the malware does, you know, wh what programming language it was used, what libraries it is using. You know, there's no semantic, there's no easy to read, you know, names uh, to, that help us recognize, you know, what the attacker was thinking when he designed the uh, malware. Now, 
malware doesn't have to be something like a very complicated. You know, people think that malware is designed by genius, you know, by very smart people. Well, not really. <laughs> malware could be as easy as a, um, you know, malicious code that is written in Visual Basic for application in VBA. It can also be, be part of a very simple JavaScript. It could also be, you know, designed using Python. Uh, many programming language, many options. So you don't have to be like a, like a genius to be able to create your own malware. Of course, there are some advanced malware, and those are the zero-day attacks. You know that they are continually trying to develop more malware that that are not already documented, and there's no uh, at, at that particular point of point of time there was no defense mechanism. So this is just an example of a very simple malware that you can even try to you do yourself, you know, from the education perspective. So for example, this is a Excel with macro enable Excel. So on this Excel, in this case would be like an invoice, you know, maybe someone could receive an email stating, uh, this is an invoice template designed for small and medium business. Um, this is for free and this, and it has the logo of the government and so on, you know, to, you know, to, to facilitate the process of task tax income um, generation and, and registration, all right? So at the point that someone open up this malware, as you can see in this Excel file, it will, it will contain some malicious code. So for example, down here you can see, as soon as the person open up this Excel file, it's gonna call the redirect function. The redirect um, function in this case is gonna perform these actions. It's gonna just open up one website. This is a very simple example, of course. It could do many other things. It could download a, ma a malware. It could start you know, stealing information and upload the data in FTP into an FTP server and many other things. In this other example, I'm saying, for example, once the person resize the windows of the Excel file, you know, make it bigger or smaller, then it's gonna call this other function, you know, the fingerprint OS PowerShell. So this fingerprint OS PowerShell, it's gonna run at um, a terminal and it's gonna execute PowerShell and it's gonna obtain information about the version of the operating system, all right? And finally, on this other example, I'm gonna run a curl command using the terminal once again. As soon as the person types a value on a specific cell, you know, once the, the value of that cell change, it's gonna call the terminal function and then it's gonna run a shell command to connect via curl to a specific website. This is another example of a very simple malware. Once again, this case would be with JavaScript. Nowadays, many, um, for example, on Facebook, you see people that are offering things and they say, okay, the first 10 people that register on this website will obtain, I don't know, a scholarship or they will obtain a free iPhone or whatever, right? They, they use social engineering techniques like, causing you know a scarcity or trying to make people think that it's normal that it's gonna it's a bit of big opportunity and so on so on this particular example down here i create just a google a google form as you can see it is supposed to be for someone who wants a scholarship with a big discount of 20 percent and the total cost it requires some basic data but again in the back end it's gonna it, it's gonna have a, a script in this case using google forms there's a, a script editor and in a script editor, you can write, you know, code that it could be designed, you know, for good or for bad. In this case, it would be just to open up the uh, an specific website um, without, you know, the human interaction. As soon as they start uh, working on this form, in parallel, this tab will be will be open, and it's going to close, you know, automatically. Now, how malware can be distributed? So there are many techniques, in this case, using social engineering techniques to try to motivate people to open up this type of malicious files or to try to access malicious hyperlinks. For example, one of them is smishing. In this case, they are sending text, text message through even a social media, like, I don't know, like WhatsApp or a Facebook or whatever. So they use social engineering techniques to try to motivate people to, once again, download or click on those hyperlinks. Another technique is known as phishing. In this case, they're gonna send tons and tons of emails, you know, to multiple people. Um, you know, once again, they could use the logo of a specific company. The even the the letters will look like very similar to the one that is official under that are in the official website. Um, 
and it, it could try to have a pretext to motivate people to do something, okay? And another one, this is a very a funny one. You know, I don't know if you like, you know, Mr. Robot, but in the Mr. Robot series, they talk about uh, a rubber ducky. So basically it's a USB key, you know, this USB key, they are going to inject a virus and this virus is gonna, and the auto run function is gonna copy automatically once they connect these type of devices. So for example, in pen test, penetration testing efforts, it's very common that um, engineers, you know, they design this type, this type of attacks you know, for good to verify if some employees will fall on that trick and they will connect this type of devices directly to the computer of the, of the company. Now, as you can see on these specific examples, we need to send some, we need to prepare a file, right? That file needs to be downloaded. That file needs to be executed. Now there are other ways to distribute malware. In this case, we are talking about fileless malware using living of the land techniques. In this case, using binaries that already exist on the operating system, using scripts that already exist on the operating system. And they are using good tools. You know, in this case, OLMI, which is the Windows Management Instrumentation System, you know, they're using PowerShell, which is very good. You know, with PowerShell, you can do automation, you can improve the maintenance of your uh, equipment. Um, you can connect, you know, with the Active Directory for using reconciliation uh, with exchange, whatever, right? It's a very, very powerful. And of course with the cloud. Now also with the terminal, you know, with the terminal, you can configure um, a job, you know, with the task scheduler to, for example, to coordinate backups. So there are three basic examples of how you can use these uh, tools for good. However, you can use them for performing a malware, mal a fileless malware attack. So what is the idea down here? The idea is to try to execute malicious software without being installed, trying to execute malicious commands that are gonna be executed directly in memory. They are not gonna affect the OS. They are not gonna affect the, um, the hard drive, right? Everything is gonna be on memory directly. This is a very interesting example. This is, is was used using Elk framework. So with Elk framework, it, it works very, very interesting. So the attacker is gonna, in this case, is gonna prepare a payload and it's gonna upload the payload in um, a popular, in this case, um, a cloud-based uh, software as a service solution, okay? So this cloud-based um, yes, software as a service solution is designed for people you know, to interact, to share files at the same time, you know, to uh, concurrently work on the same, same file and work together, okay? Now the idea down here is, is the following. So the attacker, once he uploads the, the payload, He's gonna try to use social engineering to motivate someone to do something. In this case, to motivate someone to run some specific commands on their computer. You know, maybe they are going, they simulate that these commands are, are going to block a specific vulnerability, try to implement them as soon as possible, right? Someone is gonna go down there, someone is gonna copy and paste them on a terminal, just as an example. So what is gonna happen at that point? The payload in this case is, is designed to, uh, I'm sorry, the commands are designed to, in this case, connect to the software as a service solution, it's not going to download, it's gonna read the data, the malicious commands that are uh, uploaded in the cloud, and then it's gonna execute those malicious commands directly on memory without installing, okay? So uh, when, for example, those commands could be designed to enable the attacker to have shell access using a reverse shell. So in this case, the attacker, uh, when he create or he or she, you know, um, develop uh, upload the payload. At that very moment, this person can also prepare the, his computer or his equipment to uh, have a port open, ready to listen on that port for incoming connections. In this case, for a reverse shell connection. So the, the victim is gonna connect to the computer of the attacker on a specific port. And that at that point, the attacker is gonna have shell access. So once the attacker have shell access, it will be just a matter of time to start losing your files, to start losing control of your computer and many other bad things could happen. Now let's talk a little bit about the stenography. So stenography for me is a very interesting technique. This phrase is a very famous phrase from Margaret in Divalu. Excuse me, I'm sorry for my pronunciation. Unfortunately, my French is not very good. However, this phrase is very good. It says, the more hidden the venom, the more dangerous it is. And that's exactly what a stenography is designed for. 
the idea is to try to send messages, the idea is to try to send payloads, the idea is to try to send malicious code uh, without being detected. So this is not new, this has been used for, for ages. For example, a long time ago, you know, um, there was this slave that the, they, they, they use this slave as a carrier, you know, they decide, okay, let's send a message, let's write a message in a tattoo in the, in the head of this person, okay? So they shave his head, they wrote the tattoo, they wait till the hair came back, and then they send this slave to Persia. At the other side, there was this person waiting for this slave. He knew that he was supposed to shave his head to knew the secret message. Once he shaved his head, the message was to coordinate an attack against Persia, all right? For example, in the Second World War, there was these micro dots, you know, on pictures that contains text. So only those that knew where to find on those pictures data and, and have a way to magnify to see the data, they will be able to see the secret message. Then of course, when we were kids, we always play around, you know, with the invisible ink, you know, using a lemon or things like that. So this is also a, a, a very simple example of our stenography. And nowadays, stenography has been used not only just for sending messages, but it's been used to send payloads to steal information. It's been used by the te terrorist attacks, you know, terrorist uh, groups to communicate between each other without being tracked or without being detected. So for example, everybody likes to share, you know, funny pictures on their social media, right? On, on WhatsApp or Facebook or any of these. The problem down there is that we don't know who designed these memes. We don't know who, who if inside these memes are some hidden information or there's a payload. So there's a risk, a really high risk of being sharing, of sharing continuously this, this type of data. Once again, because we don't know if it has inside any malicious code. Now, what could go wrong? You know, the attacker could be able to steal personal identifiable information. They could be able to um, download, you know, have some commands that if he has, if he has a way to extract the commands that is hidden in the pictures, he will be able to convert your computer in a bot. Once again, your bot will communicate with a command and control. Once the attacker has access to your computer and has full control of your computer, your computer will be, become a zombie and your computer will be part of a botnet. All right, the, your, the picture could have a hyperlink, for example, of a malicious code of, of a hyperlink that has malicious information. Or they don't, sometimes they, they, they just want to play a little bit smarter. So they don't want to modify at all the picture. They will just alter the values on the metadata. You know, remember that the metadata will be some attributes, some uh, attributes that you know, represent the picture. For example, it says the what camera was used when the picture was taken, the geolocation. So there are some text fields on, that every picture has and every file has, so they can hide those type of commands in the metadata. Once again, the idea is to send, in this case, messages or commands hidden in a carrier option. So what could go wrong with the scenario with the improper use of a stenography. It could be used to steal information. And you know that once information is stealed, there's an information a security breach. The reputation of many companies will go down and some companies are, are not able to recover after an attack. Of course, as I mentioned, the picture could be part of an attack that is designed to try to download a ransomware. And once the ransomware attacks, if the company is not ready, then um, you know, the confidentiality of the data will be lost you know, attackers will be able to access confidential data. They will try to, um, um, you know, try, they will tell the victim, okay, if you don't pay this amount of money, then we'll just share the list, the full list of all your customers on this hacker forum or, or this, you know, dark side forum. And of course they will try to recover their investment. So they will, they will ask for money for that. Many companies that are not ready to manage those type of situation will start will end paying, which is not a good idea because, um, you know, it will it will demonstrate the attacker that is a good business, is a good area where they can earn a lot of money. Also, as you know, there are some companies, there are some insurance companies that are offering insurance in case of a ransomer, and that once again, that's a 
dual layer situation because attacker will say, okay, if the victim doesn't pay me, then the insurance company will pay me. So I, it increases the possibility to earn money for the attacker. Economy losses, of course, you know, attack customers will not like to have their money on a bank that has been attacked, that has, has a security breach. So they will lose their customers, they will lose their profit, they will lose opportunity for business. And customers, of course, they will be impacted, they, their data privacy will be lost, they will not be able to access their systems and their data could be affected. Now, this is a, an example of a real stakeholder attack. So this person was, used to work for a technology company and this company, was, this person was stealing um, some uh, important and confidential data about a new technology that, has, that was being developed at that time. And he tried to sell those type of information to China. Okay, so how he did it, he was hiding all the data in very nice pictures like sunsets and these type of things. And he was sending those pictures to his personal email using the corporate computer. So of course he was um, prosecuted. However, this is an example of a steroid attack where steganography was used for bad. So can you, what can you use to steal information? What can you use to hide information? You can use different type of carriers. One of them could be pictures, as I was mentioning. You can use video, you can use PDF files, even Word, Excel, PowerPoint, any, any type of um, file, basically. And even audio files, like an MP3, a WAV file. So there are many type of carriers from the digital perspective um, that could be used to steal information and to send data to the attackers. How does it work? Well, one of the most common techniques and very simple techniques will be the least significant bit. As you know, every image is composed of very uh, small units known as pixels, and each pixel will represent a color code, right? That color code will be based on the combination of three main colors, the red, green, and blue, right? Every single, the combination of these red, green, and blue will generate, you know, a new ton of color. So the idea down here is to try to perform very small and very uh, smart, you know, changes to the uh, color coding, right? That at the end will enable us to hide sections of whatever I want to hide in some specific pixels or group of pixels that are gonna be distributed in the, in the image that a human eye will not be able to detect. For a human eye will just look exactly the same picture, but at the end, inside those color coding, there, there will be some values that are gonna be encoded in, using this technique. For example, let, let's say that I want to hide uh, this information, okay? So I want to hide this data. The color coding for this data will be 178, which is at the end, this type of ton of yellow, all right? The original pixel without being affected, this is the color code, in this case, 117, which has a, a little bit brighter, you know, ton. So what the attacker will do, the attacker will try to modify some bits some bits of the a pixel that will represent a color code that is very similar to the original that a human eye will not be able to detect. For me, this is almost the same, probably because I'm not wearing my glasses, but they're almost the same. And as you can see, even the color code is very 117, 123, you know, they, so once again, they make a, made a very small change, but they were able to hide a section of the code that they want to send inside a pixel and the color coding was again, very similar. Now, is this too difficult to implement? Extremely easy. There are many tools that are available, you know, open source tools that are available to um, use stenography. But once again, stenography is not bad. It can be used for copyright protection. You can be, it can be used to confirm, you know, that you download an MP3 file from the proper uh, artist you know, or singer. Right? However, it can be used for bad. So one example could be this one. This, this tool is known as a stack online. This tool doesn't need any admin rights. As long as you're able to access this website, then you will be able to hide information. So just as an example, if I go down here and I select any picture, let's say that I want to select, I'm going to the desktop, I'm going to hack in progress. I'm going to select this R15. I want to embed some data. Okay, I, I just modify any 
a pixel, you know, and what exact what section of the color coding I want to change, you know, the red, the green, or the blue, and then whatever I want to to, to hide. For example, hacking Paris. So as you can see, the picture looks exactly the same as the original one, and then I'm got, I'm just going to download it. There it goes. So this is downloaded picture. And this is the original. As you can see, for a human eye, they look exactly the same. However, one of these pictures has the data that has been um, embedded. So how can I extract the data? Well, it will be a very similar process. So in this case, I'm going to upload the file. In this case, which file? The one that I just unloaded. I need to extract. I hide the data on these three yeah, pixels. I'm just going to click on go. And it says this is in human readable format, the information that was sent hidden. As you can see, once again, there was no need to install anything. It was just a matter of access in this website. You can also do the same thing with, um, once again, the living of the land you know, technique using the copy command. The copy command is a good command. It's a command design to that could help for backups purposes. However, it could be used for a secondary attack. So this, look at this. So it's very simple. You just type uh, copy slash B, all right? The name of the cover file, what, what you want to hide, and then the cover file. So let's make a quick test. So for example, if I click on down here, I click there. I see that there's a, uh, there are a couple of pictures like R15, the one that I just used. There's a, a text file. Let's say that this is a file that I want to hide. So let's see what it, what it has. Okay, so this text file has a message that says this is a test. That's all that it has. So I'm going to try to hide it on here. So copy slash P because I want to modify the uh, carrier file on the, in a binary format. So the cover file will be in this case, the Yamaha. All right, plus what I want to hide, the hidden, okay, one space, and then the name of the new files, for example, car, that PNG. All right, so now if I click there, now I'm gonna see a car, that PNG. So once again, if I go down here and look for car, that PNG, you see the picture? It looks exactly the same, nothing weird down here. However, if you open up this file, maybe with a notepad. And if you go down to the bottom, you're gonna see that says, this is a test in plain text. So this is how you were able to hide information in this um, picture easily. Now, how you, can you hide information even in a more complicated way? So you can use three tools, pain, coagula, and sonic visualizer. So it's very simple. For example, I'm gonna go first to pain. All right, I'm gonna type something down here. Okay, then I'm gonna draw a line, a line. This is just a way to save time because with the line, when the system is gonna analyze the picture, it's gonna know that this is the end. So after that, there's nothing hidden. So I'm just gonna click on save as, I'm gonna save this as a PN, PMP, PMP. Mm -hmm. uh, let me go to the desktop. All right, so now I have a picture, that's it. That picture contains the text that I want to hide. Now let's see how we can play around with this. So if I go to Guagula, I go to the desktop, Hacking Paris. There's a Hacking Paris on here. Perfect. So the process that I'm gonna try to do right now is to convert this picture into a sound file. So how do I do it? Very easily, just go to sound and then click on render without blue. If you're, use, if you're wearing headsets, just take it out because it's gonna make a very uncomfortable noise.
perfect. Now we have a picture that has been converted into a sound file. So I'm going to save it as a sound file. And I'm going to go down here once again to Hacking Paris. I'm going to type Hacking Paris music. All right. So if I go to the desktop now, to the Hacking Paris, now you're going to see that I have an audio file. And as you saw, on, using the previous, previous example, I could even um, download an MP3 file, maybe with my favorite rock song. And then I'm gonna, I could easily hide this WAV file into the MP3 file and even play the MP3 file, MP3 file without any issue. Okay. Now, how can I extract the data that has been hidden? I could do it with the following tool. If I go to Sonic Visualizer, There is. Then I'm going to have to open up the file that has been created. In this case, the Hacking Paris music. All right, down here, there's nothing. This is just an audio file that has been analyzed. So now I'm going to go to the layer, um, the spectrogram, and then all channels. Okay, once again, I don't see nothing important down here. To make it easier to read, you can change it for black and white, and then just zoom in. And as you can see down here, it says, I can see in plain text, the information that has been hidden. Okay. Now, once again, we can combine techniques. We can combine steganography, malware, and fileless malware to perform this attack. Okay, let's see an example. Let's say that someone uh, prepare a payload, that payload that has been sent to the victim, the victim um, unfortunately double clicks on the attached file. And when they, attach, they double click on the attached file, it's gonna create a reverse shell connection. So now the attacker has access to the shell of the computer, of the, of the computer victim, okay? So when he has access to the shell of the uh, victim, he's gonna type PowerShell and then he will be able to execute PowerShell commands. Once again, without installing nothing down from this point on, we are going to try to cause damage without installing any application or downloading. For example, let's say that this attacker is gonna go to the document section and he found a couple of files that caught their attention, like, like they're precious, like the way this guy said in the Lord of the Ring movie. So uh, let's, for example, let's imagine that this customer that TXT contains, you know, PI information about customers, this server, that TXT contains technical data about you know, IP addresses, operating system, what is, a, what is the function of that web server, of that server. So we want to try to steal that information. How can we steal that data easily without installing nothing we could use? Uh, in this case, the compressed that archive, this is gonna create a zip file where we are going to hide whatever is in the, in this case, in the document uh, folder. So whatever is in the document folder is gonna be, um, compress and embed it in a zip file. In this case, the gold zip file. Then um, to start generating some need on the customer to, on the victim to pay, if we want to ask for money, we could delete the files from his computer. So using once again, an existing command, remove that I dash item. It's gonna, in this case, I'm gonna say, delete everything that is in the document folder. And this is interesting because when they, when you execute this command, those files will not go to the recycle bin. They will be deleted. You know, there's, it's not, this recycle bin will be empty. So if you have a backup or you don't have, you don't know how to do some forensics to record files, then you will be in trouble. Now let's try to apply stenography on this attack. So in this case, I'm gonna go to the downloads folder and with the FS util um, command, which again is an existing, uh, binary that is already on the computer, I'm going to create on the fly a picture that is big enough, in this case, a cover file that is big enough where I can hide the zip file. In this case, the zip file is very small because it's just an example, 1K. So I'm going to create this 58 kilobytes um, file to hide the gold zip. That's it. So I just, with this command, I was able to create this, this picture. Of course, this picture is not going to contain some random values. So it's not gonna, it's gonna, it's not gonna look like a real picture, but at least for the operating system, it is a picture. 
So using the copy command that I just showed you previously, I, I'm able to hide the zip file inside the cover file and create a stego file. In this case, the uh, playa.php, that's the file that contains the zip file that you know that the zip file contains the two files that we were able to steal. And once again, we can use the remove item goal and remove item, uh, the remove item to delete, I'm sorry, the zip file and also to delete the cover file. Now, interesting. So you may say, okay, I'm able at this point to steal data. Yes, I'm able to uh, generate the need because we delete the original files. We have, we know where the file is hidden, but how can I obtain the copy of the file as an attacker, right? Well, easy, interesting would be that we could use a, a, a you know, a solution that is designed to protect us. In this case, Windows Defender to upload the file that contains the value, in this case, the zip file that contains the uh, valuable data, whatever we want. So I'm not saying the Windows Defender is bad. Windows Defender is a very good solution. However, this is an example of how you can use good tools for a bad. And of course, we want to delete our tracks. So we can use a PowerShell to get an event lock. And in this case, I'm gonna go lazy. I'm just gonna say delete everything, all the logs from the event lock. Of course, you can do even better. You can just say delete these specific entries from the event log to delete your tracks. And once I executed, you see that before I did it, there was almost 8,000 you know, events. And then there was only one. And the only one that is under is where I cleared the, the other logs. And your imagination will be the limit. You know, you can start, you know, a ransomware a similar attack or take a strategy. You can leave a node under and continue playing around. Now, how can you protect? So the first, the number one would be through good and very con through very good and, and also through continuous training. You need to learn what type of social engineering techniques exist. You need to make sure that everybody on your company know what is social engineering. They know how to detect you know, a phishing email. They know how to detect a, a, a smishing. They know how to detect you know, a fake call like phishing because there are many ways to try to fool people because that's the weakest, um, yeah, the weakest link you know, in the chain. And, and, and you know, the chain will be as strong as a weakest link. So that's why you need to make sure everybody has the proper training. Endpoint security, yes, you need to have a way to detect on each and every one of the devices if something is not working properly, if there's any malware that is trying to be executed or any commands, malicious command that is being executed. To try to protect against information leakage, make sure they have a data leakage protection system that is gonna analyze the data, that the outgoing data to avoid that type of data to reach you know, the, the, the destination, you know, from this case, the destination of the attacker. Network security, um, this is important, not only from the perimeter perspective, but also from the zero trust perspective. Make sure that you analyze, that you have proper authentication, that you have proper identification, that you have a way to protect each and every one of your network devices, uh, that you have the proper uh, updates, you know, firmware, uh, and so on. So this is a multi-layer, as you can see, solution. We have to make like, like, a, like as you can see, like an onion here as many layers as possible so the attacker will not feel comfortable. They will start losing time. They will start losing money because at the end, they also have to invest to attack. So they have to recover their investment. So the, the harder and the most complicated we do, it will be better for us. And it's not gonna be a very good uh, business for them, for the attackers. Make sure they have a proper monitoring. You know, you have a SIM to be able to detect on real time what is going on, that you have the proper team and train team, you know, to identify if it is a false positive, if it is a false negative, and they have the proper incident management plan. Uh, I implement least privilege. In other words, only assign um, the privileges that are required to people to perform their job. No more, not less. Only what is strictly required. Okay. So why would you enable, for example, um, a secretary to be able to access the panel and control? Why? Is, is it there any technical reason? If there's no business need, then don't assign those type of rights to people because it, it doesn't impact in any way on their, uh, on their ability to perform their job. Uh, monitor what commands are being executed. I'm gonna show you shortly you know, a couple of options. So when I was saying uh, 
to make sure that you have a proper endpoint protection is, for example, make sure you have an antivirus, you have a, an EDR system, that you have, a, for example, a host-based intrusion detection system to detect some possible situations that are being that are occurring. Implement a DLP, as I was mentioning, your email and even if instant messaging solution. And because this type of, you know, as I was mentioning, there are some malware that are that is able to change polymorphic malware. Make sure you have a implemented. A, behavior analytic solutions and also machine learning. So they, they can start analyzing data based on patterns and detect new behaviors that are not, a, that could be a, a, a malicious situation. Monitor, for example, changes on the services, a, a new service that has been, that is a start, you know, and uh, for why that a service went down, who shut down that service? Um, changes on the Windows registry. Why a change is being performed in the Windows registry? Are you installing something? What is being installed, right? And monitor applications. In the EDR, there are EDRs that are able to detect the use of, for example, of malicious commands using PowerShell, as you can see down here. So make sure that you have proper EDRs to detect the use of um, load bins, even of the lands, you know, binaries and scripts that could be used for bad. Minimalism and control, this is extremely important. So once again, I'm not saying that a, that a PowerShell is bad or a Windows management system is bad. Uh, no, just make sure that you monitor and that you enable only what is strictly required. Make sure that you have a proper separation of duties. That is extremely important. The person that is able, that, that is, um, that is gonna be implementing a change as an example, th that person cannot be the same person that is gonna approve that change. You have to have different, uh, duties assigned to different people to make sure that you have a proper, you know, separation of duties once again. Um, install only require management tools. There are many management tools for Windows, for Linux, um, for Android, whatever, but just make sure to only install whatever it is required. If you don't need them anymore and install those uh, management tools. Monitor their usage and make sure that you monitor those accounts that has more privilege. In this case, the privilege access management using a PAM solution. From the tracking perspective, um, you know that PowerShell commands can be tracked. And so you can you can enable the tracking of the user of PowerShell commands using the group policy editor. And of course, make sure that you have a way to aggregate logs and to analyze the logs and you have a proper use cases, proper alerts that you're continually fine tuning you know, the alerts to make sure that you are as effective as possible. Finally, make sure that your equipments are up to date. You know, have a, a proper patch management a solution implemented. You make sure that your system are up to date, not only on drivers but also on firmware, but also on updates. You know, hot fixes, whatever is required. And and extremely important, have an inventory. Know exactly what you have because if if not, you know you will not be able to protect them. You need to know what software a uh, you have license. You know what applications are being used, what computers do you have, right? What operating system and so on. Make sure you have a good inventory, even virtual machines. You need to avoid, you know, virtual machine or VMS Pro, you know, which is that lack of proper inventory of a uh, virtual machines that you have on your environment. You can, there are many solutions. This is just one of them that could be useful for this type of options. So I hope you like this presentation. It's been a pleasure to be with you. So thank you very much. And pura vida, like the way we say in my country, Costa Rica. So thank you. <laughs>